Swan would endeavour not to find charm and beauty in the women with whom he must pass his time, but to pass his time among women whom he had already found to be beautiful and charming. And these were, as often as not, women whose beauty was of a distinctly common type. If on his travels he met a family whom it would have been more correct for him to make no attempt to know, but among whom a woman caught his eye, adorned with a special charm that was new to him, to remain on his high horse and to cheat the desire that she had kindled in him, to substitute a pleasure different from that which he might have tasted in her company by writing to invite one of his former mistresses to come and join him, would have seemed to him as cowardly an abdication in the face of life, as stupid a renunciation of a new form of happiness, as if, instead of visiting the country where he was, he'd shut himself up in his own rooms and looked at views of Paris. He did not immure himself in the solid structure of his social relations, but made of them so as to be able to set it up afresh upon new foundations wherever a woman might take his fancy, one of those collapsible tents which explorers carry about with them. Any part of it which was not portable or could not be adapted to some fresh pleasure, he would discard as valueless, however enviable it might appear to others. How often had his credit with the Duchess built up of the yearly accumulation of her desire to do him some favour for which he had never found an opportunity, been squandered in a moment by his calling upon her in an indiscreetly worded message for a recommendation by telegraph which would put him in touch at once with one of her agents whose daughter he had noticed in the country, just as a starving man might barter a diamond for a crust of bread. Indeed, when it was too late, he would laugh at himself for it, for there was in his nature, redeemed by many rare refinements, an element of clownishness. Then he belonged to that class of intelligent men who led a life of idleness and who seek consolation and perhaps an excuse in the idea which their idleness offers to their intelligence, the idea that life contains situations more interesting and more romantic than all the romances ever written. So, at least, he would assure and had no difficulty in persuading the more subtle among his friends in the fashionable world, notably the Baron de Chalos, whom he liked to amuse with stories of the startling adventures that had befallen him, such as when he had met a woman in the train and had taken her home with him before discovering that she was the sister of a reigning monarch in whose hands were gathered at that moment all the threads of European politics of which he found himself kept informed in the most delightful fashion. Or when, in the complexity of circumstances, it depended upon the choice which the conclave was about to make, whether he might or might not become the lover of somebody's cook. It was not only the brilliant phalanx of virtuous dowagers, generals and academicians to whom he was bound by such close ties that Swan compelled with so much cynicism to serve him as panders. All his friends were accustomed to receive from time to time letters which called on them for a word of recommendation or introduction. When he used to write to my grandfather, the latter, recognizing his friend's handwriting on the envelope, would exclaim, Here's Swan asking for something. On guard! <laughs> and either from distrust or from the unconscious spirit of devilry which urges us to offer a thing only to those who do not want it, my grandparents would meet with an obstinate refusal the most easily satisfied of his prayers, as when he begged them for an introduction to a girl who dined with us every Sunday and whom they were obliged, whenever Swan mentioned her, to pretend that they no longer saw. Occasionally, a couple of my grandparents' acquaintance, who had been complaining for some time that they never saw Swan now, would announce with satisfaction, and perhaps with a slight inclination to make my grandparents envious of them, that he'd suddenly become as charming as he could possibly be and was never out of their house. My grandfather would not care to shatter their pleasant illusion would look at my grandmother as he hummed the air of what is this mystery i cannot understand it or of vision fugitive a few months later if my grandfather asked swan's new friend what about swan do you still see as much of him as ever the other's face would lengthen never mention his name to me again but i thought that you were such friends He'd been intimate in this way for several months with some cousins of my grandmother, dining almost every evening at their house. Suddenly, and without any warning, he ceased to appear. They supposed him to be ill, and the lady of the house was going to send to inquire for him, when, in her kitchen, she found a letter in his hand, 
which her cook had left by accident in the housekeeping book. In this, he announced that he was leaving Paris and wouldn't be able to come to the house again. The cook had been his mistress. And at the moment of breaking off relations, she was the only one of the household whom he had thought it necessary to inform. But when his mistress for the time being was a woman in society, or at least one whose birth was not so lowly nor her position so irregular that he was unable to arrange for her reception in society, then for her sake he would return to it, but only to the particular orbit in which she moved or into which he had drawn her. Every evening, after a slight wave imparted to his stiffly brushed red locks, had tempered with a certain softness the ardor of his bold green eyes, he would select a flower for his buttonhole and set out to meet his mistress at the house of one or other of the women of his circle. And then, thinking of the affection and admiration which the fashionable folk, whom he always treated exactly as he pleased, would, when he met them there, lavish upon him in the presence of the woman whom he loved. He would find a fresh charm in that word of the existence of which he had grown weary, but whose substance, pervaded and warmly coloured by the flickering light which he had slipped into its midst, seemed to him beautiful and rare, now that he had incorporated in it a fresh love. But while each of these attachments, each of these flirtations, had been the realization, more or less complete, of a dream born of the sight of a face or a form which Swan had spontaneously, and without effort on his part, found charming, it was quite another matter when, one day at the theatre, he was introduced to Odette de Cressy by an old friend of his own, who had spoken of her to him as a ravishing creature with whom he might very possibly come to an understanding but had made her out to be harder of conquest than she actually was, so as to appear to be conferring a special favour by the introduction. She had struck Swan not certainly as being devoid of beauty, but as endowed with a style of beauty which left him indifferent, which aroused in him no desire, which gave him indeed a sort of physical repulsion. As one of those women of whom every man can name some, and each will name different examples, were the converse of the type which our senses demand. To give him any pleasure, her profile was too sharp, her skin too delicate, her cheekbones too prominent, her features too tightly drawn. Her eyes were fine, but so large that they seemed to be bending beneath their own weight, strained the rest of her face, and always made her appear unwell or in an ill humour. Some time after this introduction at the theatre, she had written to ask Swan whether she might see his collection which would interest her so much, she, an ignorant woman with a taste for beautiful things, saying that she would know him better once she had seen him in his home, where she imagined him to be so comfortable with his tea and his books, although she had not concealed her surprise at his being in that part of the town, which must be so depressing, and was not nearly smart enough for such a very smart man. And when he allowed her to come, she had said to him as she left how sorry she was to have stayed such a short time in the house into which she was so glad to have found her way at last, speaking of him as though he had meant something more to her than the rest of the people she knew, and appearing to unite their two selves with a kind of romantic bond which had made him smile. But at the time of life, tinged already with disenchantment, which Swan was approaching, when a man can content himself with being in love for the pleasure of loving without expecting too much in return, this linking of hearts, if it is no longer, as in early youth, the goal towards which love of necessity tends, still is bound to love by so strong an association of ideas that it may well become the cause of love if it presents itself first. In his younger days, a man dreams of possessing the heart of the woman he loves. Later, the feeling that he possesses the heart of the woman may be enough to make him fall in love with her. And so, at an age when it would appear that the taste for feminine beauty must play the larger part in its procreation, love may come into being, love of the most physical order, without any foundation in desire. At this time of life, a man has already been wounded more than once by the darts of love. It no longer evolves by itself, obeying its own incomprehensible and fatal laws before his passive and astonished heart. We come to its aid. We falsify it by memory and by suggestion. 
Recognizing one of its symptoms, we recall and recreate the rest. Since we possess its hymn engraved on our hearts in its entirety, there is no need for any woman to repeat the opening lines potent with the admiration which her beauty inspires for us to remember all that follows. And if she begin in the middle, where it sings of our existing henceforward for one another only, we are well enough attuned to that music to be able to take it up and follow our partner without hesitation at the first pause in her voice. Odette de Cressy came again to see Swan. Her visits grew more frequent, and doubtless each visit revived the sense of disappointment which she felt at the sight of a face whose details he had somewhat forgotten in the interval not remembering it as either so expressive or, in spite of her youth, so faded. He used to regret, while she was talking to him, that her rarely considerable beauty was not of the kind which he spontaneously admired. But after Odette had left him, Swan would think with a smile of her telling him how the time would drag until he allowed her to come again. He remembered the anxious, timid way in which she had once begged him that it might not be very long, and the way in which she had looked at him then, fixing upon him her fearful and imploring gaze, which gave her such a touching air beneath the bunches of artificial pansies fastened in the front of her round bonnet of white straw, tied with strings of black velvet. And won't you, she had ventured, come just once and take tea with me? He had pleaded pressure of work, an essay, which, in reality, he'd abandoned years ago, on Vermeer of Delft. Oh, I know I'm quite useless, she'd replied, a little wild thing like me beside a great learned man like you. I should be like the frog in the fable. Yet I should so much like to learn, to know things, to be initiated. What fun it would be to become a regular bookworm, to bury my nose in a lot of old papers, she'd gone on, with that self-satisfied air which a smart woman adopts when she insists that her one desire is to give herself up without fear of soiling her fingers to some unclean task, such as cooking the dinner with her hands right in the dish itself. Ah, you'll only laugh at me, but this painter who stops you from seeing me, she meant Vermeer, I've never even heard of him. Is he alive still? Can I see any of his things in Paris? so as to have some idea of what's going on behind that great brow which works so hard, that head which I feel sure is always puzzling away about things, just to be able to say, there, that's what he's thinking about. Oh, what a dream it would be to be able to help you with your work. He'd sought an excuse in his fear of forming new friendships, which he gallantly described as his fear of a hopeless passion. You are afraid of falling in love? How funny that is, when I go about seeking nothing else would give my soul just to find a little love somewhere, she'd said, so naturally, and with such an air of conviction that he had been genuinely touched. Some woman must have made you suffer, and you think the rest are all like her. Ah, she can't have understood you. You are so utterly different from ordinary men. That's what I liked about you when I first saw you. I felt at once that you weren't like everybody else. And then, besides, there's yourself. He continued, I know what women are. You must have a whole heap of things to do, and never any time to spare. I? Why, I've never anything to do. I'm always free. I'll always be free if you want me. And whatever hour of the day or night may suit you to see me, just send for me, and I shall be only too delighted to come. Will you do that? Do you know what I'd really like? To introduce you to Madame Verdurin, where I go every evening. Just fancy my finding you there and thinking it was a little for my sake that you had gone. No doubt in thus remembering their conversations, in thinking about her thus when he was alone, he did no more than call her image into being among those of countless other women in his romantic dreams. But if, thanks to some accidental circumstance, the image of Odette de Cressy came to absorb the whole of his dreams, if from those dreams the memory of her could no longer be eliminated, then her bodily imperfections would no longer be of the least importance, nor would the conformity of her body, more or less than any other, to the requirements of Swan's taste, since, having become the body of her whom he loves, it must henceforth be the only one capable of causing him joy or anguish. It so happened that my grandfather had known the family of these Verdurins, but he had entirely severed his connection with what he called young Verdurin, 
taking a general view of him as one who had fallen, though without losing hold of his millions, among the riff-raff of Bohemia. One day he received a letter from Swan asking whether my grandfather could put him in touch with the Virginians. On guard, on guard, he exclaimed as he read it. I'm not at all surprised. Swan was bound to finish up like this. A nice lot of people. I can't do what he asks, because in the first place, I no longer know the gentleman in question. Besides, there must be a woman in it somewhere. I don't mix myself up in such matters. Ah, well. We shall see some fun. Swan begins running after the little virgins. And on my grandfather's refusal to act as sponsor, it was Odette herself who had taken Swan to the house. And so, night after night, she would be taken home in Swan's carriage. And one night, after she'd got down, while he stood at the gate and murmured, till tomorrow then, she turned impulsively from him, plucked a last lingering chrysanthemum in the tiny garden which flanked the pathway from the street to her house. And as he went back to his carriage, thrust it into his hand. He held it pressed to his lips during the drive home, and when in due course the flower withered, locked it away like something very precious in a secret drawer of his desk. He would escort her to her gate, but no farther. Twice only had he gone inside to take part in the ceremony of such vital importance in her life of afternoon tea. Odette had received him in a tea gown of pink silk with her neck and arms bare. She made him sit down beside her in one of those many mysterious little retreats which had been contrived in the various recesses of the room, sheltered by enormous palm trees growing out of pots of Chinese porcelain, or by screens upon which were fastened photographs and fans and bows of ribbon. She had said at once, you are not comfortable there. Wait a minute, I'll arrange things for you. And with a twitter of laughter, the complacency of which implied that some little invention of her own was being brought into play, She'd installed behind his head and beneath his feet great cushions of Japanese silk, which she pummeled and buffeted as though determined to lavish upon him all her riches regardless of their value. She found something quaint in the shape of each of her Chinese ornaments and also in her orchids, the catillas especially, because they had the supreme merit of not looking in the least like other flowers, but of being made, apparently, out of scraps of silk or satin. It looks just as though it had been cut out of the lining of my cloak, she said to Swan, pointing to an orchid, with a shade of respect in her voice for so smart a flower, this distinguished, unexpected sister, whom nature had suddenly bestowed upon her, so far removed from her in the scale of existence, and yet so delicate, so refined, so much more worthy than many real women of admission to her drawing room. As she drew his attention now to the fiery tongue dragons painted upon a bowl or stitched upon a fire screen, now to a fleshy cluster of orchids, now to a dromedary of inlaid silver work with ruby eyes which kept company upon her mantelpiece with a toad carved in jade, she would pretend now to be shrinking from the ferocity of the monsters or laughing at their absurdity, now blushing at the indecency of the flowers now carried away by an irresistible desire to run across and kiss the toad and dromedary, calling them darlings. And these affectations were in sharp contrast to the sincerity of some of her attitudes, notably her devotion to Our Lady of the Leghetto, who at once, when Odette was living at Nice, cured her of a mortal illness, and whose medal, in gold, she always carried on her person, attributing to it unlimited powers. She poured out Swan's tea, inquiring, lemon or cream? And on his answering, cream, please, went on smiling, a clown. And as he pronounced it excellent, you see, I know just how you like it. This tea had indeed seemed to Swan, just as it seemed to her, something precious. And love is so far obliged to find some justification for itself some guarantee of its duration in pleasures which, on the contrary, would have no existence apart from love and must cease with its passing, that when he left her at seven o'clock to go and dress for the evening, all the way home, sitting bolt upright in his brougham, unable to repress the happiness with which the afternoon's adventure had filled him, he kept on repeating to himself, what fun it would be to have a little woman like that 
in a place where one could always be certain of finding what one can never be certain of finding, a really good cup of tea. An hour or so later, he received a note from Odette and at once recognized that florid handwriting in which an affectation of British stiffness imposed an apparent discipline upon its shapeless characters, significant perhaps to less intimate eyes than his, of an untidiness of mind, a fragmentary education, a want of sincerity and decision. Swan had left his cigarette case at her house. Why, she wrote, did you not forget your heart also? I should never have let you have that back. More important, perhaps, was a second visit which he paid to her a little later. On his way to the house, as always when he knew that they were to meet, he formed a picture of her in his mind, and the necessity, if he was to find any beauty in her face, of fixing his eyes on the fresh and rosy protuberance of her cheekbones, and of shutting out all the rest, which was so often languorous and sallow, plunged him in an acute depression, as proving that one's ideal is always unattainable and one's actual happiness mediocre. He was taking her an engraving, which she had asked to see. She was not very well. She received him wearing a wrapper of mauve crepe de chine, which draped her bosom like a mantle with a richly embroidered web. As she stood there beside him, brushing his cheek with the loosened tresses of her hair, bending one knee in what was almost a dancer's pose, so that she could lean without tiring herself over the picture, at which she was gazing with bended head out of those great eyes which seemed so weary and so sullen when there was nothing to animate her. Swan was struck by her resemblance to the figure of Zippero, Jethro's daughter, which is to be seen in one of the Sistine frescoes. He had always found a peculiar fascination in tracing in the paintings of the old masters not merely the general characteristics of the people whom he encountered in his daily life, but rather what seems least susceptible of generalization, the individual features of men and women whom he knew, as, for instance, in a bust of the Doge Loredan by Antonio Rizzo, the prominent cheekbones, the slanting eyebrows, in short, a speaking likeness of his own coachman, Remy. In the coloring of a girl and the nose of Monsieur de Parence. In a portrait by Tintoretto, the invasion of the plumpness of the cheek by an outcrop of whisker, the broken nose, the penetrating stare, the swollen eyelids of Dr. de Bourbon. He stood gazing at her. Traces of the old fresco were apparent in her face and limbs, and these he tried incessantly afterwards to recapture, both when he was with Odette and when he was only thinking of her in her absence. The words Florentine painting were invaluable to Swan. They enabled him, gave him, as it were, a legal title to introduce the image of Odette into a world of dreams and fancies which, until then, she had been debarred from entering, and where she assumed a new and nobler form. And whereas the mere sight of her in the flesh, by perpetually reviving his misgivings as to the quality of her face, her figure, the whole of her beauty, used to cool the ardor of his love. These misgivings were swept away, and that love confirmed, now that he could re-erect his estimate of her on the sure foundations of his aesthetic principles. On his study table at which he worked, he had placed, as it were, a photograph of Odette, a reproduction of Jethro's daughter. He would gaze in admiration at the large eyes, the delicate features in which the imperfections of her skin might be surmised the marvellous locks of hair that fell along her tired cheeks, and adapting what he'd already felt to be beautiful on aesthetic grounds to the idea of a living woman, he converted it into a series of physical merits which he congratulated himself on finding assembled in the person of one whom he might ultimately possess. It was not only Odette's indifference, however, that he must take pains to circumvent, it was also, not infrequently, his own. Feeling that, since Odette had had every facility for seeing him, she seemed no longer to have very much to say to him when they did meet. He was afraid lest the manner, at once trivial, monotonous, and seemingly unalterable, which she now adopted when they were together, should ultimately destroy in him that romantic hope that a day might come when she would make avowal of her passion. 
by which hope alone he had become and would remain her lover. And so to alter, to give a fresh moral aspect to that Odette, of whose unchanging mood he was afraid of growing weary, he wrote, suddenly, a letter full of hinted discoveries and feigned indignation, which he sent after her so that it should reach her before dinner time. He knew that she would be frightened and that she would reply, and he hoped that, when the fear of losing him clutched at her heart, it would force from her words such as he had never yet heard her utter. And he was right. By repeating this device, he had won from her the most affectionate letters that she had so far written him. One of them, which she had sent to him at midday by a special messenger from a Maison Dorée, it was on the day of the paris morsi fete, given for the victims of the recent floods in Morsia, beginning, My dear, my hand trembles so that I can scarcely write. And these letters he had kept in the same drawer as the withered chrysanthemum. Or else, if she had not had time to write, when he arrived at the Verdun's, she would come running up to him with, I've something to say to you. And he would gaze curiously at the revelation in her face and speech of what she had hitherto kept concealed from him of her heart. Even as he drew near to the Verdun's door and caught sight of the great lamp-lit spaces of the drawing room windows, whose shutters were never closed, he would begin to melt at the thought of the charming creature whom he would see as he entered the room, basking in that golden light. Here and there, the figures of the guests stood out, sharp and black, between the lamp and window, shutting off the light, like those little pictures which one sees sometimes pasted here and there upon a glass screen, whose other panes are mere transparencies. He would try to make out Odette, and then, when he was once inside, without thinking, his eyes sparkled suddenly with such a radiant happiness that Monsieur Verdurin said to the painter, Mm-hmm, seems to be getting warm. And so the simple and regular manifestations of a social organism, named the Little Clan, were transformed for Swan into a series of daily encounters with Odette, and enabled him to feign indifference to the prospect of seeing her, or even a desire not to see her, in doing which he incurred no very great risk, since, even although he had written to her during the day, he would of necessity see her in the evening and accompany her home. But one evening, when, irritated by the thought of that inevitable dark drive together, he had taken his other little girl all the way to the Bois, so as to delay as long as possible the moment of his appearance at the Verdurins, he was so late in reaching them that Odette, supposing that he didn't intend to come, had already left. Seeing the room bare of her, strung by a sudden anguish, he shook with the sense that he was being deprived of a pleasure whose intensity he began then for the first time to estimate, having always, hitherto, had that certainty of finding it whenever he would, which, as in the case of all our pleasures, reduced if it did not altogether blind him to its dimensions. Did you notice the face he pulled when he saw that she wasn't here? Monsieur Verdurin asked his wife. I think we might say that he's hooked. The face he pulled, exploded Dr. Cotard, who, having left the house for a moment to visit a patient, had just returned to fetch his wife and didn't know whom they were discussing. Oh, do you mean to say you didn't meet him on the doorstep, the loveliest of swans? No, Monsieur Swan's been here. Oh, just for a moment. We had a glimpse of a swan tremendously agitated in a state of nerves. You see, Odette had just left. You mean to say she's gone the whole hog with him? That she's burnt her boat? Why, of course not, answered Madame Verdurin. There's absolutely nothing in it. In fact, between you and me, I think she's making a great mistake and behaving like a silly little fool, which she is, incidentally. Come, 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 said Monsieur Verdurin. How on earth do you know that there's nothing in it? We haven't been there to see, have we now? She would have told me. I must say that she tells me everything. As she is no one else at present, I told her that she ought to live with him. She makes out that she can't. She admits... She was immensely attracted by him at first, but he's always shy with her, and that makes her shy with him. Besides, she doesn't care for him in that way, she says. It's an ideal love, platonic, you know. She's afraid of rubbing the bloom off. Oh, I don't know half the things she says. How should I? And yet, he's exactly the sort of man she wants. I beg to differ from you. 
Monsieur Verderac courteously interrupted. I'm only half satisfied with the gentleman. I feel that he poses. Anyhow, if there's nothing in it, I don't suppose it's because our friend believes in her virtue. Yet you never know. He seems to believe in her intelligence. <laughs> I don't know whether you heard the way he lectured her the other evening about Von Toy's sonata. Oh, I'm devoted to Odette, but really, to expound theories of aesthetic to her, the man must be a prize idiot. On the landing, Swan had run into the Verdurin's butler, who'd been somewhere else a moment earlier when he arrived, and had been asked by Odette to tell Swan, but that was at least an hour ago, that she would probably stop to drink a cup of chocolate at Prevost's on her way home. Swan set off at once for Prevost's, but every few yards his carriage was held up by others, or by people crossing the street, loathsome obstacles, each of which he would gladly have crushed beneath his wheels, were it not that a policeman fumbling with a notebook would delay him even longer than the actual passage of the pedestrian. He counted the minutes feverishly, adding a few seconds to each so as to be quite certain that he had not given himself short measure, and so, possibly, exaggerated whatever chance there might actually be of his arriving at Prevost in time and of finding her still there. And then, in a moment of illumination, like a man in a fever who awakes from sleep and is conscious of the absurdity of the dream shapes among which his mind has been wandering without any clear distinction between himself and them, Swan suddenly perceived how foreign to his nature were the thoughts which he had been revolving in his mind ever since he had heard at the Vergerins that Odette had left, how novel the heartache from which he was suffering but of which he was only now conscious, as though he had just woken up. What? All this disturbance? Simply because he would not be seeing or dead now till tomorrow, exactly what he'd been hoping, not an hour before, as he drove towards Madame Verdurin's. He was obliged to admit also that now, as he sat in the same carriage and drove to Provost's, that he was no longer the same man, was no longer alone even but that a new personality was there beside him, adhering to him, amalgamated with him, a creature from whom he might, perhaps, be unable to liberate himself, towards whom he might have to adopt some stratagem as one uses to outwit a master or a malady. And yet, during this last moment in which he had felt that another, a fresh personality, was thus conjoined with his own, life had seemed, somehow, more interesting. She was not at Provost's. He must search for her then in every restaurant upon the boulevards. To save time, while he went in one direction, he sent in the other his coachman, Remy, Rizzo's Doge Lorida, for whom he presently, after a fruitless search, found himself waiting at the spot where the carriage was to meet him. But as he drew up opposite him, Swan asked not, did you find the lady, but remind me tomorrow to order some more firewood I'm sure we must be running short. Perhaps he had persuaded himself that if Remy had at last found Odette in some cafe where she was waiting for him still, then his night of misery was already obliterated by the realization begun already in his mind of a night of joy. And there was no need for him to hasten towards the attainment of a happiness already captured and held in a safe place which would not escape his grasp again. The coachman came back, however, with the report that he could not find her anywhere and added the advice as an old and privileged servant, I think, sir, that all we can do now is to go home. But the air of indifference which Swan could so lightly assume when Remy uttered his final unalterable response fell from him like a cast-off cloak when he saw Remy attempt to make him abandon hope and retire from the quest. Certainly not, he exclaimed. We must find the lady. It's most important. She would be extremely put out. It's a business matter. And vexed with me if she didn't see me. But I don't see how the lady can be vexed, sir, answered Remy, since it was she that went away without waiting for you, sir, and said she was going to Prevost's, and then wasn't there. Meanwhile, the restaurants were closing and their lights began to go out. Under the trees of the boulevard, there were still a few people strolling to and fro, barely distinguishable in the gathering darkness. Now and then, the ghost of a woman glided up to Swan, murmured a few words in his ear, asked him to take her home, and left him shuddering. Anxiously, he explored every one of these vaguely seen shapes, as though among the phantoms of the dead, in the realms of darkness, he had been searching 
for a lost Eurydice. Among all the methods by which love is brought into being, among all the agents which disseminate that blessed bane, there are few so efficacious as the great gust of agitation which, now and then, sweeps over the human spirit. For then, the creature in whose company we are seeking amusement at the moment, her lot is cast, her fate and ours decided, that is the creature whom we shall henceforth love. It is not necessary that she should have pleased us up till then any more or even as much as others. All that is necessary is that our taste for her should become exclusive. And that condition is fulfilled so soon as, in the moment when she has failed to meet us, for the pleasure which we were on the point of enjoying in her charming company is abruptly substituted an anxious, torturing desire, whose object is the creature herself, an irrational, absurd desire, an insensate, agonizing desire to possess her. Swan made Remy drive him to such restaurants as were still open. It was the sole hypothesis now of that happiness which he had contemplated so calmly. He no longer concealed his agitation. The price that he set upon their meeting and promised in case of success to reward his coachman as though by inspiring in him a will to triumph which would reinforce his own, he could bring it to pass by a miracle that Odette, assuming that she had long since gone home to bed, might yet be found seated in some restaurant on the boulevards. He pursued the quest as far as the Maison Dorée, burst twice into Tortone's, and, still without catching sight of her, was emerging from the Café Anglais, striding with haggard gaze towards his carriage, when he collided with a person coming in the opposite direction. It was Odette. She explained, later, that there'd been no room at Prévost's, that she'd gone, instead, to sup at the Maison Dorée, and had been sitting there in an alcove where he must have overlooked her and that she was now looking for her carriage. Now the joy, which his reason had never ceased to assure him was not that evening at least to be realized, was suddenly apparent and more real than ever before. There was no need for him to draw on his own resources to endow it with truth. Twas from itself that there emanated, twas itself that projected towards him that truth whose glorious rays melted and scattered like the cloud of a dream the sense of loneliness which had lured over him. So will a traveller who's come down on a day of glorious weather to the Mediterranean shore, and is doubtful whether they still exist, those lands which he's left, let his eyes be dazzled rather than cast a backward glance by the radiance streaming towards him from the luminous and unfading azure at his feet. He climbed after her into the carriage which she had kept waiting and ordered his own to follow. She had in her hand a bunch of catalias, and Swan could see, beneath the film of lace that covered her head, more of the same flowers fastened to a swan's down plume. She was wearing, under her cloak, a flowing gown of black velvet, caught up on one side to reveal a large triangular patch of her white silk skirt, with an insertion, also of white silk, in the cleft of her low-necked bodice, in which there were fastened a few more catalogs. She had scarcely recovered from the shock which the sight of Swan had given her, when some obstacle made the horse start to one side. They were thrown forward from their seats. She uttered a cry and fell back, quivering and breathless. It's all right, he assured her. Don't be frightened. And he slipped his arm around her shoulder, supporting her body against his own. Then went on, whatever you do, don't utter a word. Just make a sign, yes or no, or you'll be out of breath again. You won't mind if I put the flowers straight on your bodice. The jolt has loosened them. I'm afraid of their dropping out. I'm just going to fasten them a little more securely. She was not used to being treated with so much formality by men, and smiled as she answered, No, not at all. I don't mind in the least. But he, chilled a little by her answer, perhaps also to bear out the pretense that he'd been sincere in adopting the stratagem, or even because he was already beginning to believe that he had been, exclaimed, No, no, you mustn't speak. You'll be out of breath again. You can easily answer in signs. I shall understand. Really and truly now, do you mind my doing this? Look, there's a little, uh, I think it must be pollen spilt over your dress. 
Now brush it off with my hand. It's not too hard. I'm not hurting you, am I? I'm tickling you, perhaps a little. I don't want to touch the velvet in case I rub it the wrong way. But don't you see, I really had to fasten the flowers. They would have fallen out if I hadn't. Right? Well, now, could I just push them a little further down? Seriously, I'm not annoying you, am I? If I just sniff them to see whether they've really lost all their scent, I don't believe I ever smelt any before. Yeah. Tell me the truth. Still smiling, she shrugged her shoulders ever so slightly as one who would say, You're quite mad. You know very well that I like it. He slipped his other hand upwards along Odette's cheek. She fixed her eyes on him with that languishing and solemn air which marks the women of the old Florentine's paintings, in whose faces he had found the type of hers. Swimming at the brink of her fringed lids, her brilliant eyes, large and finely drawn as theirs, seemed on the verge of breaking from her face and rolling down her cheeks like two great tears. She bent her neck, as all their necks may be seen to bend, in the pagan scenes as well as in the scriptural. And although her attitude was, doubtless, habitual and instinctive, one which she knew to be appropriate to such moments, and was careful not to forget to assume, she seemed to need all her strength to hold her face back, as though some invisible force were drawing it down towards Swanwood. And Swan it was who, before she allowed her face, as though despite her efforts to fall upon his lips, held it back for a moment longer at a little distance between his hands. He had intended to leave time for her mind to overtake her body's movements. And perhaps, moreover, Swan himself was fixing upon these features of an Odette not yet possessed, not even kissed by him, on whom he was looking now for the last time, that comprehensive gaze with which, on the day of his departure, a traveller strives to bear away with him in memory the view of a country to which he may never return. But he was so shy in approaching her that, after this evening, which had begun by his arranging her cataliers and had ended in her complete surrender, whether from fear of chilling her or from reluctance to appear even retrospectively to have lied, or perhaps because he lacked the audacity to formulate a more urgent requirement than this, which could always be repeated since it had not annoyed her on the first occasion, he resorted to the same pretext on the following days. If she had any catalyst pinned on her bodice, he would say, It's most unfortunate. The catalyst don't need tucking in this evening. They've not been disturbed as they were the other night. I think, though, this one isn't quite straight. May I see if they've more scent than the others? Or else, if she had none, Oh, no catalyst this evening. Then there's nothing for me to arrange. So that for some time there was no change from the procedure which he had followed on the first evening, when he had started by touching her throat with his fingers first and then with his lips, but their caresses began invariably with this modest exploration. And long afterwards, when the arrangement, or rather the ritual pretense of an arrangement, of her catalyst had quite fallen into desuetude, the metaphor, do a catalyst transmuted into a simple verb which they would employ without a thought of its original meaning when they wished to refer to an act of physical possession, in which, paradoxically, the possessor possesses nothing, survived to commemorate in their vocabulary the long-forgotten custom from which it sprang. And yet, possibly, this particular manner of saying to make love had not the precise significance of its synonym. However disillusioned we may be about women, however we may regard the possession of even the most divergent types as an invariable and monotonous experience, every detail of which is known and can be described in advance, it still becomes a fresh and stimulating pleasure if the woman concerned be, or be thought to be, so difficult as to oblige us to base our attack upon some unrehearsed incident in our relations with them as was originally for Swan, the arrangement of the catalyst. He trembled, as he hoped, that evening, 
that it was the possession of this woman that would emerge for him from their large and richly colored petals. And the pleasure which he felt already seemed to him for that reason as it might have seemed to the first man when he enjoyed it amid the flowers of the earthly paradise. A pleasure which had never before existed, which he was striving now to create, a pleasure and the special name which he was to give it preserved its identity entirely individual and new. The ice once broken, every evening, when he had taken her home, he must follow her into the house. And often she would come out again in her dressing gown and escort him to his carriage, would kiss him before the eyes of his coachman, saying, what on earth does it matter what people see? And on the evenings when he did not go to the Virginas, which happened occasionally now that he had opportunities of meeting Odette elsewhere, when, more and more rarely, he went into society, she would beg him to come to her on his way home, however late he might be. The season was spring, the nights clear and frosty. He would come away from an evening party, jump into his Victoria, spread a rug over his knees, tell the friends who were leaving at the same time and who insisted on his going home with them that he could not, that he was not going in their direction. Then the coachman would start off at a fast trot without further orders knowing quite well where he had to go. His friends would be left marvelling, and, as a matter of fact, Swan was no longer the same man. No one ever received a letter from him now demanding an introduction to a woman. He'd ceased to pay any attention to women and kept away from the places in which they were ordinarily to be met. Swan could not without anxiety ask himself what Odette would mean to him in the years that were to come. Sometimes, as he looked up from his Victoria on those fine and frosty nights of early spring and saw the dazzling moonbeams fall between his eyes and the deserted streets, he would think of that other face, gleaming and faintly roseate like the moon's, which had one day risen on the horizon of his mind and since then had shed upon the world that mysterious light in which he saw it bathed. If he arrived after the hour at which Odette sent her servants to bed, he would rap upon the pane and she would hear the signal and answer. He would find, lying open on the piano, some of her favorite music, the Valse de Rose, the Pauvre Fou of Taliafico, which, according to instructions embodied in her will, was to be played at her funeral. But he would ask her instead to give him the little phrase from Van Toy's sonata. It was true that Odette played vitally, but often the fairest impression of what remains in our minds of a favorite air is one which has arisen out of a jumble of wrong notes struck by unskillful fingers upon a tuneless piano. The little phrase was associated in Swan's mind with his love for Odette. He felt clearly that his love was something to which there were no corresponding external signs, whose meaning could not be proved by any but himself. He realized, too, that Odette's qualities were not such as to justify his setting so high a value on the hours he spent in her company. And often, when the cold government of reason stood unchallenged, he would readily have ceased to sacrifice so many of his intellectual and social interests to this imaginary pleasure. But the little phrase, as soon as it struck his ear, had the power to liberate in him the room that was needed to contain it. The proportions of Swan's soul were altered. Watching Swan's face while he listened to the phrase, one would have said that he was inhaling an anesthetic which allowed him to breathe more deeply. Deep repose, mysterious refreshment for Swan, for him whose eyes, although delicate interpreters of painting, whose mind, although an acute observer of manners, must bear forever the indelible imprint of the barrenness of his life, to feel himself transformed into a creature foreign to humanity, blinded, deprived of his logical faculty, almost a fantastic unicorn, a chimera-like creature conscious of the world through his two ears alone. And as, notwithstanding, he sought in the little phrase for a meaning to which his intelligence could not descend, with what a strange frenzy of intoxication must he strip bare his inmost soul of the whole armor of reason 
and make it pass unattended through the straining vessel down into the dark filter of sound. He began to reckon up how much that was painful, perhaps even how much secret and unappeased sorrow underlay the sweetness of the phrase. And yet to him it brought no suffering. What matter though the phrase repeated that love is frail and fleeting when his love was so strong? He played with the melancholy which the phrase diffused. He felt it stealing over him, but like a caress, which only deepened and sweetened his sense of his own happiness. He would make Odette play him the phrase again, ten, twenty times on end, insisting that while she played, she must never cease to kiss him. Every kiss provokes another. Ah, in those earliest days of love, how naturally the kisses spring to life. How closely in their abundance are they pressed one against another until lovers would find it as hard to count the kisses exchanged in an hour as to count the flowers in a meadow in May. Then she would pretend to stop, saying, How do you expect me to play when you keep on holding me? I can't do everything at once. Make up your mind what you want. Am I to play the phrase, or do you want to play with me? Then he would become annoyed, and she burst out with a laugh which was transformed as it left her lips and descended upon him in a shower of kisses or else she would look at him sulkily, and he would see once again a face worthy to figure in Botticelli's Life of Moses, and he would place it there, giving to Odette's neck the necessary inclination. And when he had finished her portrait in distemper in the 15th century on the wall of the Sistine, the idea that she was, nonetheless, in the room with him still, by the piano, at that very minute, ready to be kissed and won, the idea of her material existence, of her being alive, would sweep over him with so violent an intoxication that, with eyes starting from his head and jaws that parted as though to devour her, he would fling himself upon this Botticelli maiden and kiss and bite her cheeks. And then, as soon as he had left the house, not without returning to kiss her once again because he'd forgotten to take away with him in memory some detail of her fragrance or her features, while he drove home in his Victoria, blessing the name of Odette who allowed him to pay her these daily visits, which, although they could not, he felt, bring any great happiness to her, still, by keeping him immune from the fever of jealousy, by removing from him every possibility of a fresh outbreak of the heart sickness which had manifested itself in him that evening when he had failed to find her at the Verdurins, might help him to arrive, without any recurrence of those crises, of which the first had been so distressing that it must also be the last, at the termination of this strange series of hours in his life, hours almost enchanted, in the same manner as those other following hours in which he drove through a deserted Paris by the light of the moon. Noticing as he drove home that the satellite had now changed its position relatively to his own and was almost touching the horizon, feeling that his love also was obedient to these immutable laws of nature, he asked himself whether this period upon which he had entered was to last much longer, whether presently his mind's eye would cease to behold that dear countenance, save as occupying a distant and diminished position, and on the verge of ceasing to shed on him the radiance of its charm. For Swann was finding in things once more, since he had fallen in love, the charm that he had found when, in his adolescence, he had fancied himself an artist, with this difference, that what charm lay in them now was conferred by Odette alone. He could feel reawakening in himself the inspirations of his boyhood, which had been dissipated among the frivolities of his later life. But they all bore now the reflection, the stamp of a particular being. And during the long hours which he now found a subtle pleasure in spending at home, alone with his convalescent spirit, he became gradually himself again, but himself in thraldom to another. Swan had assured himself that the one thing which, more than anything else, would make him cease to love her would be her refusal to abandon the habit of lying. Even from the point of view of coquetry, pure and simple, he had told her. Can't you see how much of your attraction you throw away when you stoop to lie? 
by a frank admission, how many faults you might redeem. Really, you are far less intelligent than I supposed. In vain, however, did Spawn expound to her thus all the reasons that she had for not lying. They might have succeeded in overthrowing any universal system of mendacity, but Odette had no such system. She contented herself merely whenever she wished Swan to remain in ignorance of anything she had done with not telling him of it. So that a lie was, to her, something to be used only as a special expedient. And the one thing that could make her decide whether she should avail herself of a lie or not was a reason which, too, was of a special and contingent order, namely the risk of Swan's discovering that she had not told him the truth. Physically, she was passing through an unfortunate phase. She was growing stouter, and the expressive, sorrowful charm, the surprised, wistful expressions which she had formerly had, seemed to have vanished with her first youth, with the result that she became most precious to Swan at the very moment when he found her distinctly less good-looking. He would gaze at her for hours on end, trying to recapture the charm which he had once seen in her and could not find again. And yet the knowledge that, within this new and strange chrysalis, it was still Odette that lurked, still the same volatile temperament, artful and evasive, was enough to keep Swan seeking with as much passion as ever to captivate her. Then he would look at photographs of her taken two years before and would remember how exquisite she had been. And that would console him a little for all the sufferings that he'd voluntarily endured on her account. Although she would not allow him, as a rule, to meet her at public gatherings, saying that people would talk, it happened occasionally that, at an evening party to which he and she had each been invited, at Forchevilles, at the Painters, or at a charity ball given in one of the ministries, he found himself in the same room with her. He could see her, but dared not remain, for fear of annoying her by seeming to be spying upon the pleasures which she tasted in other company, pleasures which while he drove home in utter loneliness and went to bed, seemed illimitable to him, since he'd not been able to see their end. And once or twice, he derived from such evenings that kind of happiness which one would be inclined, did it not originate in so violent a reaction from an anxiety abruptly terminated, to call peaceful, since it consists in a pacifying of the mind. He'd looked in for a moment at a revel in the painter's studio, and was getting ready to go home. He was leaving behind him Odette, transformed into a brilliant stranger, surrounded by men to whom her glances and her gaiety, which were not for him, seemed to hint at some voluptuous pleasure to be enjoyed there or elsewhere, possibly at the Bal des Encourants, to which he trembled to think that she might be going on afterwards, which made Spawn more jealous than the thought of their actual physical union, since it was more difficult to imagine. He was opening the door to go when he heard himself call back in these words, which, by cutting off from the party that possible ending which had so appalled him, made the party itself seem innocent in retrospect, made Odette's return home a thing no longer inconceivable and terrible, but tender and familiar, a thing that kept close to his side, like part of his own daily life in his carriage a thing that stripped Odette herself of the excess of brilliance and gaiety in her appearance, showed that it was only a disguise which she had assumed for a moment for his sake, and not in view of any mysterious pleasures, a disguise of which she had already wearied. In these words which Odette flung out after him as he was crossing the threshold, Can't you wait a minute for me? I'm just going. We'll drive back together and you can drop me. It was true that on one occasion Forcheville had asked to be driven home at the same time. But when, on reaching Odette's gate, he had begged to be allowed to come in too, she had replied with a finger pointed at Swan, Ah, that depends on this gentleman. You must ask him. Very well, you may come in just for a moment if you insist. But you mustn't stay long, for I warn you, he likes to sit and talk quietly with me. He's not at all pleased if I have visitors when he's here. Oh, if only you knew the creature as I know him. Isn't that so, my love? There's no one that really knows you, is there, except me? And as she spoke, she bestowed on him a smile which he interpreted as meaning that she was entirely his. And then, while she was making them some orangeade, 
suddenly, just as when the reflector of a lamp that is badly fitted begins by casting all around an object on the wall beyond it, huge and fantastic shadows which, in time, contract and are lost in the shadow of the object itself, all the terrible and disturbing ideas which he had formed of Odette melted away and vanished in the charming creature who stood there before his eyes. But how rare these moments were, and how seldom now he saw her. Even in regard to their evening meetings, she would never tell him until the last minute whether she would be able to see him. For, reckoning on his always being free, she wished first to be certain that no one else would offer to come to her. She would plead that she was obliged to wait for an answer which was of the very greatest importance, and if, even after she had made Swan come to her house, any of her friends asked her halfway through the evening to join them at some theatre or at a supper afterwards, she would jump for joy and dress herself with all speed. And as her toilet progressed, every movement that she made brought Swan nearer to the moment when he would have to part from her, when she would fly off with an irresistible force. And when at length she was ready and plunging into the mirror a last glance, strained and brightened by her anxiety to look well, smeared a little salve on her lips, fixed a stray lock of hair over her brow, and called for her cloak of sky-blue silk and golden tassels, Swan would be looking so wretched that she would be unable to restrain a gesture of impatience as she flung at him. So that's how you thank me for keeping you here till the last minute. And I thought I was being so nice to you. Well, I shall know better another time. Sometimes, at the risk of annoying her, he made up his mind that he would find out where she had gone, and even dreamed of a defensive alliance with Forcheville, who might perhaps have been able to tell him. Even when he could not discover where she had gone, it would have sufficed to alleviate the anguish that he then felt, for which Odette's presence, the charm of her company, was the sole specific, a specific which in the long run served, like many other remedies, to aggravate the disease, but at least brought temporary relief to his sufferings. It would have sufficed had Odette only permitted him to remain in her house while she was out, to wait there until the hour of her return, into whose stillness and peace would flow to be mingled and lost there all memory of those intervening hours which some sorcery, some cursed spell had made him imagine as somehow different from the rest. But she would not. He must return home. He forced himself on the way to form various plans, ceased to think about death. He even reached the stage while he was undressing of turning over all sorts of happy ideas in his mind. It was with a light heart Buoyed with the anticipation of going to see some favorite work of art on the morrow, that he jumped into bed and turned out the light. But no sooner had he made himself ready to sleep, relaxing the self-control of which he was not even conscious, so habitual had it become, that an icy shudder convulsed his body, and he burst into sobs. He did not wish to know why, but dried his eyes, saying with a smile, ha, This is delightful. I am becoming a neurasthenic. After which he could not save himself from utter exhaustion at the thought that next day he must begin afresh his attempt to find out what Odette had been doing, must use all his influence to contrive to see her. This compulsion to an activity without respite, without variety, without result, was so cruel a scourge that one day, noticing a swelling over his stomach, he felt an actual joy in the idea that he had, perhaps, a tumor which would prove fatal, that he need not concern himself with anything further, that it was his malady which was going to govern his life, to make a plaything of him until the not distant end. If indeed at this period it often happened that, though without admitting it even to himself, he longed for death, it was in order to escape not so much from the keenness of his sufferings as from the monotony of his struggle. And yet he would have wished to live until the time came when he no longer loved her, when she would have no reason for lying to him, when at length he might learn from her whether she had or had not been in the arms of Forshvi. Often for several days on end, the suspicion that she was in love with someone else would distract his mind from the question of Forshvi, 
making it almost immaterial to him, like those new developments of a continuous state of ill health which seem for a little time to have delivered us from their predecessors. There were even days when he was not tormented by any suspicion. He fancied that he was cured. But next morning when he awoke, he felt in the same place the same pain, a sensation which the day before he had, as it were, diluted in the torrent of different impressions. But it had not stirred from its place. Indeed, it was the sharpness of this pain that had awakened him. Sometimes he hoped that she would die, painlessly, in some accident. She, who was out of doors, in the streets, crossing the busy thoroughfares from morning to night. And as she always returned safe and sound, he marveled at the strength, at the suppleness of the human body, which was able continually to hold in check, to outwit all the perils that environed it, which to Swan seemed innumerable, since his own secret desire had strewn them in her path and so allowed its occupant, the soul, to abandon itself day after day, and almost with impunity, to its career of mendacity, to the pursuit of pleasure. One day he received an anonymous letter, which told him that Odette had been the mistress of countless men, several of whom it named, among them Forcheville, Monsieur de Breauté, and the painter, and women and that she frequented houses of ill fame. He was tormented by the discovery that there was to be numbered among his friends a creature capable of sending him such a letter, for certain details betrayed in the writer a familiarity with his private life. He wondered who it could be. As for the actual contents of the letter, they did not disturb him, for in not one of the charges which it formulated against Odette could he see the least vestige of fact. Like many other men, Swan had a naturally lazy mind and was slow in invention. He knew quite well as a general truth that human life is full of contrasts. But in the case of any one human being, he imagined all that part of his or her life with which he was not familiar as being identical with the part with which he was. He imagined what was kept secret from him in the light of what was revealed. At such times as he spent with Odette, if their conversation turned upon an indelicate act committed or an indelicate sentiment expressed by some third person, she would ruthlessly condemn the culprit by virtue of the same moral principles which Swan had always heard expressed by his own parents and to which he himself had remained loyal. And then she would arrange her flowers, would sip her tea, would show an interest in his work. So Swan extended those habits to fill the rest of her life. He reconstructed those actions when he wished to form a picture of the moments in which he and she were apart. If anyone had portrayed her to him as she was, or rather as she had been so long with himself, but had substituted some other man, he would have been distressed, for such a portrait would have struck him as lifelike. But to suppose that she went to bad houses, that she abandoned herself to orgies with other women, that she led the crapulous existence of the most abject, the most contemptible of mortals, would be an insane wandering of the mind, for the realization of which, thank heaven, the chrysanthemums that he could imagine, the daily cups of tea, the virtuous indignation, left neither time nor place. One day, after the longest period of calm through which he had yet been able to exist without being overtaken by an attack of jealousy, he had accepted an invitation to spend the evening at the theatre with the Princesse de Lorme. Having opened his newspaper to find out what was being played, the sight of the title, La Fille des Marbes by Théodore Barrière, struck him so cruel a blow that he recoiled instinctively from it and turned his head away, illuminated as though by a row of footlights in the new surroundings in which it now appeared, that word marble, which he had lost the power to distinguish, so often had it passed in print beneath his eyes, had suddenly become visible once again, and had at once brought back to his mind the story which Odette had told him long ago of a visit which she had paid to the salon at the Palais d'Industrie with Madame Verdurin, 
who had said to her, take care now, I know how to melt you all right. You are not made of marble. Odysseus assured him that it was only a joke and he did not attach any importance to it at the time. But he'd had more confidence in her then than he had now. And the anonymous letter referred explicitly to relations of that sort. He went to see Odette. He sat down, keeping at a distance from her. He did not dare to embrace her, not knowing whether in her, in himself, it would be affection or anger that a kiss would provoke. He sat there silent, watching their love expire. Suddenly he made up his mind. Odette, my darling, he began. I know I'm being simply odious, but I must ask you a few questions. You remember what I once thought about you and Madame Verdurin? Tell me, was it true? Have you, with her or anyone else, ever? She shook her head, pursing her lips together, a sign which people commonly employ to signify that they're not going because it would bore them to go when someone has asked, are you coming to watch the procession go by, or will you be at the review? When he saw death thus make him a sign that the insinuation was false, he realized that it was quite possibly true. I've told you I never did. You know quite well, she added, seeming angry and uncomfortable. Yes, I know all that, but are you quite sure? Don't say to me, you know quite well. Say, I have never done anything of that sort with any woman. I've never done anything of that sort with any woman. Can you swear it to me on your Laghetto medal? Oh, you make me so miserable. Have you nearly done? What's the matter with you today? You seem to have made up your mind that I'm to be forced to hate you, to curse you. Look, I was anxious to be friends with you again, for us to have a nice time together like the old days. And this is all the thanks I get. However, he would not let her go but sat there like a surgeon who waits for a spasm to subside that has interrupted his operation, but need not make him abandon it. You're quite wrong in supposing that I bear you the least ill will in the world, Odette. I never speak to you except of what I already know, and I always know a great deal more than I say. But you alone can mollify by your confession what makes me hate you, so long as it has been reported to me only by other people. Odette. Do not prolong this moment which is torturing us both. If you are willing to end it at once, you shall be free of it forever. Tell me, upon your medal, yes or no, whether you have ever done those things. How on earth can I tell? She was furious. Perhaps I have ever so long ago when I didn't know what I was doing. Perhaps two or three times. Swan had prepared himself for all possibilities. Reality must, therefore, be something which bears no relation to possibilities, any more than the stab of a knife in one's body bears to the gradual movement of the clouds overhead. Since those words, two or three times, carved, as it were, a cross upon the living tissues of his heart, a strange thing, indeed, that those words, two or three times, nothing more than a few words, words uttered in the air, at a distance, could so lacerate a man's heart as if they had actually pierced it, could sicken a man like a poison that he had drunk. And yet this Odette, from whom all this evil sprang, was no less dear to him, was, on the contrary, more precious, as if, in proportion as his sufferings increased, there increased at the same time the price of the sedative, of the antidote which this woman alone possessed. He wished to pay her more attention, as one attends to a disease which one discovers suddenly to have grown more serious. He wished that the terrible thing which she had told him she had done two or three times might be prevented from occurring again. Already he had begun to put further questions. For his jealousy, which had taken an amount of trouble such as no enemy would have incurred to strike him this mortal blow, to make him forcibly acquainted with the most cruel pain that he'd ever known, his jealousy was not satisfied that he had yet suffered enough and sought to expose his bosom to an even deeper wound. Like an evil deity, his jealousy was inspiring Swan, was thrusting him on towards destruction. 
It was not his fault, but Odette's alone, if at first his punishment was not more severe. My darling, he began again, it's all over now. Was it with anyone I know? No, I swear it wasn't. Besides, I, I think I exaggerated. I never really went as far as that. He smiled and resumed with, well, just as you like, it doesn't really matter. But it's unfortunate that you can't give me any name. If I were able to form an idea of the person, that would prevent my ever thinking of her again. I say it for your own sake, because then I shouldn't bother you any more about it. So soothing to be able to form a clear picture of things in one's mind. What's really so terrible is what one cannot imagine. Ah, oh, but you've been so sweet to me, I don't want to tire you. I do thank you with all my heart for all the good that you've done me. I've quite finished now. Only one word more. How many times? Oh, Charles, can't you see you're killing me? It's all ever so long ago. I've never given it a thought. Anyone would say that you were positively trying to put those ideas into my head again, and then you'd be a lot better off. I only wish to know whether it had been since I knew you. It's only natural. Did it happen here ever? You can't give me any particular evening so that I can remind myself of what I was doing at the time. You understand, surely, that it's not possible that you don't remember with whom or that, my love. But I don't know, really, I don't. I think it was in the bar, one evening when you came to meet us on the island. You'd been dining with the Princesse de Lobe, she added, happy to be able to furnish him with an exact detail which testified to her veracity. At the next table, there was a woman whom I hadn't seen for ever so long. She said to me, come along round behind the rock there and look at the moonlight on the water. Well, at first I just yawned. I said, no, I'm too tired. I'm quite happy where I am, thank you. She swore there'd never been anything like it in the way of moonlight. I've heard that tale before, I said to her. You see, I knew quite well what she was after. Odette narrated this episode almost as if it were a joke, either because it appeared to her to be quite natural or because she thought that she was thereby minimizing its importance or else so as not to appear ashamed. But catching sight of Swan's face, she changed her tone and, You're a fiend! She flung at him. You enjoy tormenting me, making me tell you lies, just so that you leave me in peace. This second blow struck at Swan was even more excruciating than the first. Without being intelligent, Odette had the charm of being natural. She had recounted. She had acted the little scene with so much simplicity that Swan, as he gasped for breath, could vividly see it. Odette yawning. The rock there. He could hear her answer. Her last how light-heartedly. I've heard that tale before. He was saying to himself, life is indeed astonishing and holds some fine surprises. It appears that vice is far more common than one has been led to believe. Here is a woman in whom I had absolute confidence, who looks so simple, so honest, who in any case, even allowing that her morals are not strict, seems quite normal and healthy in her tastes and inclinations. I receive a most improbable accusation. I question her, and the little that she admits reveals far more than I could ever have suspected. But he could not confine himself to these detached observations. He repeated her words to himself. I knew quite well what she was after, two or three times. I've heard that tale before. But they did not reappear in his memory unarmed. Each of them held a knife with which it stabbed him afresh for a long time, like a sick man who cannot restrain himself from attempting every minute to make the movement that he knows will hurt him. He kept on murmuring to himself, I'm quite happy where I am, thank you. I've heard that tale before, but the pain was so intense that he was obliged to stop. Poor Odette. He wished her no harm. She was but half to blame. Had he not been told that it was her own mother who had sold her when she was still little more than a child at Nice to a wealthy Englishman? But what an agonizing truth was now contained for him in those lines of Alfred de Vigny's, which he had previously read without emotion. When one feels oneself smitten by love for a woman, one ought to say to oneself, what are her surroundings? 
What has been her life? All one's future happiness lies in the answer. Swan was astonished that such simple phrases as I have heard that tale before or I knew quite well what she was after could cause him so much pain. He marveled at the terrible recreative power of his memory. It was only by the weakening of that generative force whose fecundity diminishes as age creeps over one that he could hope for a relaxation of his torments. But as soon as the power that any one of Odette's sentences had to make Swan suffer seemed to be nearly exhausted, lo and behold another, one of those to which he had hitherto paid least attention, almost a new sentence, came to relieve the first and to strike at him with undiminished force. Often enough, the things that he did not know, that he dreaded now to learn, it was Odette herself who, spontaneously and without thought of what she did, revealed them to him. For the gap which her vices made between her actual life and the comparatively innocent life which Swan had believed, and often still believed his mistress to lead, was far wider than she knew. One day he was trying, without hurting Odette, to discover from her whether she had ever had any dealings with procuresses. He was, as a matter of fact, convinced that she had not. The anonymous letter had put the idea into his mind, but in a purely mechanical way. It had been received there with no credulity, but it had, for all that, remained there. And Swan, wishing to be rid of the burden of this suspicion, hoped that Odette would now extirpate it forever. Oh, dear, no. Not that they don't simply persecute me to go to them. Her smile revealed a gratified vanity which she no longer saw that it was impossible should appear legitimate to Swan. There was one of them waited more than two hours for me yesterday, said she'd give me any money I asked. It seems there's an ambassador who said to her, I'll kill myself if you don't bring her to me, meaning me. They told her I'd gone out, but she waited and waited, and in the end I had to go myself and speak to her before she'd go away. I do wish you could have seen the way I tackled her. My maid was in the next room listening and told me that I shouted fit to bring the house down. But when you hear me say that I don't want to, the idea of such a thing, I don't like it at all. I should hope I'm still free to do as I please and when I please and where I please. If I needed the money, I could understand. The porter has orders not to let her in again. He'll tell her that I'm out of town. Oh, I do wish I could have had you hidden somewhere in the room while I was talking to her. I know you'd have been pleased, my dear. There's some good in your little Odette, you see, after all, though people do say such dreadful things about her. She spoke to him once of a visit that Forcheville had paid to her on the day of the Paris Moussy fete. What? You knew him as long ago as that? Oh, yes, of course you did, he corrected himself, so as not to show that he'd been ignorant of the fact. And suddenly he began to tremble at the thought that on the day of the Paris Moussy fete, when he had received that letter he had so carefully preserved, she had been having luncheon, perhaps, with Forcheville at the Maison d'Or. She swore that she had not. Still, the Maison d'Or reminds me of something or other which I knew at the time wasn't true, he pursued, hoping to frighten her. Yes, that I hadn't been there at all that evening when I told you that I'd just come from there when you'd been looking for me at Provost's, she replied. It's quite true. I hadn't been to the Maison Dorée. I was coming away from Forcheville. I had really been to Provost's. That wasn't the story. He'd met me there and asked me to come in and look at his prints. But someone else had come to see him. I told you that I was coming from the Maison d'Or because I was afraid you might be angry with me. It was rather nice of me, really, don't you see? I admit I did wrong. But at least I'm telling you all about it now, aren't I? And what have I to gain by not telling you straight that I lunched with him on the day of the Paris Mercy fete, if it were true? Especially as at that time we didn't know one another quite so well as we do now, did we, dear? He smiled back at her with the sudden craven weakness of the utterly spiritless creature which those crushing words had made of him. And so, even in the months of which he had never dared to think again because they'd been too happy, in those months when she had loved him, she was already lying to him.
Besides that moment, that first evening on which they had done at Catalia, when she had told him that she was coming from the Maison Dorée, how many others must there have been, each of them covering a falsehood of which Swan had had no suspicion? He recalled the time when she had said to him once, I need only tell Madame Verdun that my dress wasn't ready or that my cab came late. There's always some excuse. From himself, too, probably. Many times when she had glibly uttered such words as explain a delay or justify an alteration of the hour fixed for a meeting, those moments must have hidden, without his having the least inkling of it at the time, an engagement that she had had with some other man some man to whom she had said, I need only tell Swan that my dress wasn't ready or that my cab came late. There's always some excuse. And beneath all his most pleasant memories, beneath the simplest words that Odette had ever spoken to him in those old days, words which he had believed as though they were the words of a gospel, beneath her daily actions which she had recounted to him, beneath the most ordinary places, her dressmaker's plait, the Avenue du Bois, the Hippodrome, he could feel the insinuation of a possible undercurrent of falsehood which debased for him all that had remained most precious. His happiest evenings, the Rue La Perouse itself, which Odette must constantly have been leaving at other hours than those of which she had told him. On certain evenings, she would suddenly resume towards him a kindness of which she would warn him sternly, that he must take immediate advantage under penalty of not seeing it repeated for years to come. He must instantly accompany her home to do a catalia, and the desire which she pretended to have for him was so sudden, so inexplicable, so imperious. The kisses which she lavished on him were so demonstrative and so unfamiliar that this brutal and unnatural fondness made Swan just as unhappy as any lie or unkind action. One evening when he had thus, in obedience to her command, gone home with her, and while she was interspersing her kisses with passionate words, in strange contrast to her habitual coldness, he thought suddenly that he heard a sound. He rose, searched everywhere, and found nobody. But he had not the courage to return to his place by her side. Whereupon she, in a towering rage, broke a bars with, I can never do anything right with you, you imp possible person and he was left uncertain whether she had not actually had some man concealed in the room whose jealousy she had wished to wound or else to inflame his senses the painter having been ill dr cotta recommended a sea voyage several of the faithful spoke of accompanying him the virginians could not face the prospect of being left alone in paris so first of all hired and finally purchased a yacht. Thus Odette was constantly going on a cruise. Whenever she had been away for any length of time, Swan would feel that he was beginning to detach himself from her. But as though this moral distance were proportionate to the physical distance between them, whenever he heard that Odette had returned to Paris, he could not rest without seeing her. Once. When they'd gone away, as everyone thought, for a month only, either they succumbed to a series of temptations, or else Monsieur Verdun had cunningly arranged everything beforehand to please his wife and disclosed his plans to the faithful only as time went on. Anyhow, from Algiers they flitted to Tunis, then to Italy, Greece, Constantinople, Asia Minor. They'd been absent for nearly a year and Swan had felt perfectly at ease and almost happy. One day, shortly after the return of these travellers, Swan, seeing an omnibus approach him, labelled Luxembourg, having some business there, jumped onto it and had found himself sitting opposite Madame Cotard, who was paying a round of visits to people whose day it was, in full review order, with a plume in her hat, a silk dress, a muff, an umbrella, which would do for a parasol if the rain kept off, a card case, and a pair of white gloves fresh from the cleaners. Your ears must have been burning, she ventured. While we were on the yacht with Madame Verdurin, we were talking about you all the time. Swan was genuinely astonished. 
for he supposed that his name was never uttered in the Verdurin's presence. You see, Madame Coffin went on, Mademoiselle de Cressy was there. Need I say more? When a debt's anywhere, it's never long before she begins talking about you. And you know quite well it isn't nasty things, she says. What? You don't believe me? She went on, noticing that Swan looked sceptical. And, carried away by the sincerity of her conviction, without putting any evil meaning into the word, which she used purely in the sense in which one employs it to speak of the affection that unites a pair of friends, why, she adores you. No, indeed, I'm sure it would never do to say anything against you while she was about. One would soon be taught one's place. Whatever we might be doing, if we were looking at pictures, for instance, she would say, if only we had him here. He's the man who could tell us whether it's genuine or not. There's no one like him for that. And all day long she would be saying, what can he be doing just now? I do hope he's doing a little work. It's too dreadful that a fellow with such gifts as he is should be so lazy. Forgive me, won't you? I can see him at this very moment. He's thinking of us. He's wondering where we are. Indeed, she used an expression which I thought very pretty at the time. Monsieur Verdurin asked her, how in the world can you see what he's doing when he's a thousand miles away? And Odette answered, nothing's impossible to the eye of a friend. Oh, mercy, there's the conductor stopping for me. Here, if I'd been chatting away with you, I should have gone right past the Rue Bonaparte and never noticed. Will you, will you be so kind as to tell me whether my plume is straight? And Madame Cotard withdrew from her muff to offer it to Swan a white gloved hand from which there floated, with a transfer ticket, an atmosphere of fashionable life that pervaded the omnibus, blended with the harsher fragrance of newly cleaned kid. And Swan felt himself overflowing with gratitude to her, as well as to Madame Verdure, and almost to Odette, for the feeling that he now entertained for her was no longer tinged with pain, was scarcely even to be described now as love. And from the platform of the omnibus, he followed her with loving eyes. As she gallantly threaded her way along the Rue Bonaparte, her plume erect, her skirt held up in one hand, while in the other she clasped her umbrella and her card case, so that its monogram could be seen, her muff dancing in the air before her as she went. To compete with and so to stimulate the moribund feelings that Swan had for Odette, Madame Cotter, a wiser physician in this case than ever her husband would have been, had grafted among them others more normal, feelings of gratitude, of friendship, which in Swan's mind were to make Odette again seem more human, more like other women, since other women could inspire the same feelings in him, were to hasten her final transformation back into that Odette, loved with an undisturbed affection, who had taken him home one evening after a revel at the painter's to drink orange aid with Forcheville, that Odette with whom Swan had calculated that he might live in happiness. In former times, having often thought with terror that a day must come when he would cease to be in love with Odette, he had determined to keep a sharp lookout, and as soon as he felt that love was beginning to escape him, to cling tightly to it and hold it back. But now, to the faintness of his love, there corresponded a simultaneous faintness in his desire to remain her lover. Occasionally, the name, if it caught his eye in a newspaper of one of the men whom he supposed to have been Odette's lovers, reawakened his jealousy. But when Swan happened to alight, close at hand, upon something which proved that Forcheville had been Odette's lover, he discovered that it caused him no pain, that love was now utterly remote, and he regretted that he'd had no warning of the moment in which he had emerged from it forever. And just as, before kissing Odette for the first time, he'd sought to imprint upon his memory the face that for so long had been familiar before it was altered by the additional memory of their kiss, so he could have wished, in thought at least, 
to have been in a position to bid farewell, while she still existed, to that Odette who had inspired in him love and jealousy, to that Odette who had caused him so to suffer, and whom now he would never see again. He was mistaken. He was destined to see her once again, a few weeks later. It was while he was asleep, in the twilight of a dream. He was walking with Madame Verdun, Dr. Cotard, a young man in a fez whom he failed to identify, the painter, Odette, Napoleon III, and my grandfather, along a path which followed the line of the coast and overhung the sea, now at a great height, now by a few feet only. So they were continually going up and down. Those of the party who had reached the downward slope were no longer visible to those who were still climbing. What little daylight yet remained was paling, and it seemed as though a black night was immediately to fall on them. Now and then the waves dashed against the cliff, and Swan could feel on his cheek a shower of freezing spray. The debt told him to wipe this off, but he could not, and felt confused and helpless in her company, as well as because he was in his nightshirt. He hoped that, in the darkness, this might pass unnoticed. Madame Verdurin, however, fixed her astonished gaze upon him for an endless moment, in which he saw her face change its shape. Her nose grew longer, while beneath it there sprouted a heavy moustache. He turned away to examine Odette. Her cheeks were pale, with little fiery spots, her features drawn and ringed with shadows. But she looked back at him with eyes welling with affection, ready to detach themselves like tears and to fall upon his face. And he felt that he loved her so much that he would have liked to carry her off with him at once. Suddenly Odette turned her wrist, glanced at a tiny watch and said, I must go. She took leave of everyone in the same formal manner, without taking Swan aside without telling him where they were to meet that evening or next day. He dared not ask. He would have liked to follow her, but he was obliged, without turning back in her direction, to answer with a smile some question by Madame Verdurin. But his heart was frantically beating. He felt that he now hated Odette. He would gladly have crushed those eyes which, a moment ago, he'd loved so dearly, have torn the blood into those lifeless cheeks. He continued to climb with Madame Verdurin. That is to say that each step took him further away from Odette, who was going downhill and in the other direction. A second passed, and it was many hours since she had left him. The painter remarked to Swan that Napoleon III had eclipsed himself immediately after Odette. They had obviously arranged it between them, he added. They have agreed to meet at the foot of the cliff, but they wouldn't say goodbye together. It might have looked odd. She is his mistress. The strange young man burst into tears. Swan endeavoured to console him. After all, she is quite right, he said to the young man, drying his eyes for him and taking off the fez to make him feel more at ease. I've advised her to do that myself a dozen times. Why be so distressed? He was obviously the man to understand her. So Swan reasoned with himself, for the young man whom he had failed at first to identify was himself also. As for Napoleon III, it was indeed Forcheville. For from an incomplete and changing set of images, Swan in his sleep drew false deductions enjoying at the same time such creative power that he was able to reproduce himself by a simple act of division, like certain lower organisms. With the warmth that he felt in his own palm, he modeled the hollow of a strange hand which he thought that he was clasping. In an instant, night grew black about him. An alarm rang. The inhabitants ran past him, escaping from their blazing houses. 
could hear the thunder of the surging waves and also of his own heart, which, with equal violence, was anxiously beating in his breast. Suddenly, the speed of these palpitations redoubled. He felt a pain, a nausea that were inexplicable. A peasant, dreadfully burned, flung at him as he passed. Come and ask Charles where Odette spent the night with her friend. He used to go about with her. She tells him everything. It was they that started the fire. It was his valet come to waken him and saying, Sir, it is eight o'clock and the barber is here. I've told him to call again in an hour. But these words, as they dived down through the waves of sleep in which Swan was submerged, did not reach his consciousness without undergoing that refraction which turns a ray of light at the bottom of a bowl of water into another sun. Just as, a moment earlier, the sound of the doorbell swelling in the depths of his abyss of sleep into the clangor of an alarm had engendered the episode of the fire. Meanwhile, the scenery of his dream stage scattered in dust, he opened his eyes, heard for the last time the boom of a wave in the sea, grown very distant. He touched his cheek. It was dry, and yet he could feel the sting of the cold spray and the taste of salt on his lips. He rose and dressed himself. He'd made the barber come early because he'd written the day before to my grandfather to say that he was going that afternoon to Cambrai. But while, an hour after his awakening, he was giving instructions to the barber so that his stiffly brushed hair should not become disarranged on the journey, he thought once again of his dream. He saw once again, as he had felt them close beside him, Odette's pallid complexion, her two thin cheeks, her drawn features, her tired eyes, all the things which, in the course of those successive bursts of affection which had made of his enduring love for Odette a long oblivion of the first impressions that he had formed of her, he had ceased to observe after the first few days of their intimacy. Days to which, doubtless while he slept, his memory had returned to seek the exact sensation of those things. And with that old, intermittent fatuity, which reappeared in him now that he was no longer unhappy, and lowered, at the same time, the average level of his morality, he cried out in his heart, to think that I have wasted years of my life that I have longed for death, that the greatest love that I have ever known has been for a woman who did not please me, who was not in my style.